First of all, I'd just like to welcome everybody uh, to the presentation this evening. Uh, we're delighted to have you uh, be able to tune in to this uh, Zoom webinar. So it will count as one of your CPD uh, learning opportunities if you just make sure to, to register it on the Engineers Ireland website. Um, I'd first of all, uh, just on behalf of the Roads and Transportation Society, I'd like to thank Jerry and Jane for agreeing to do the presentation uh, this evening. Um, it's fantastic to get uh, to get a presentation like this. So um, thank you very much. Uh, just to say um, in some news, the Roads and Transportation Society uh, organise a number of presentations throughout the year. So we had uh, road safety audits yesterday evening from Peter Monaghan of PMCE. Um, that should be available online, I think, shortly. Um, we obviously have this evening's presentation on public consultation uh, from Jacobs, and we have a presentation on the 2nd of, of December, Bike Life from the NTA. Finola O'Driscoll will present that. And that'll be a lunchtime learning uh, opportunity. So about one o'clock in the afternoon, and uh, we'll start advertising that shortly. And again, we're hoping to uh, roll out a lecture on mobility uh, in Cork um, in February. We'll have a, a lecture on uh, optimizing sustainability on the 20th of January as well, um, part of projects to support uh, uh, national recovery at the moment. and. Uh, that will be a, a, a presentation by J.B. Barry's uh, consultants and Dunleary uh, Rathdown County Council in relation to um, reallocation of, of road space, I suppose, during COVID and, and, and post some of the, the lockdowns. But just to welcome you this evening, the, the title of the presentation is Public Consultation on National Road Projects Under COVID-19 Restrictions. So looking at the transition traditional and virtual technology communication um, and tr trying to reach uh, various uh, groups for for ef effective public consultations um, particularly difficult uh, at the moment uh, in the current restrictions um, our speaker Chris tonight are Jerry Healy and Jane Hennessy. Jerry is the project manager for the N2 RD to Castle Blaney and Clontibber to Border Road schemes and is an associate director with Jacobs Engineering. Jerry has over 30 years experience delivering major roads projects from concept to construction and is a fellow of Engineers Ireland. Jerry's experience includes delivery of a number of roads projects through TII's phases one to four, as well as having international experience working in Qatar, the UK and for the UN and also for Dublin Airport Authority, where I came across them. <laughs> uh, Jane Hennessy. Jane is an Associate Director with Jacob's Stakeholder Engagement and Communications team in Ireland. She delivers successful engagement and public consultation projects from a variety of industries and manages a team to deliver Jacob's communications and engagement portfolio. Jane has an environmental degree with 16 years experience across a broad range of areas, including project communications, media relations, stakeholder engagement, large scale planning applications and corporate communication strategies. Jane has a proven track record in delivering communication programs for large scale infrastructure projects and has worked on securing planning on many large scale projects of national importance, managing communications from project inception through planning through construction and into the operational phase. So I'll now hand over to the speakers for this evening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, I assume everybody can hear me. Um, first off, uh, thank you for the introduction, Carol. Um, why is my slide now? Um, I, and you've obviously uh, beat me to my introduction. Um, I won't, so I won't dwell on that any further. Thank you very much. Um, just an overview of why we're here today. Um, COVID-19 really brought to the fore the challenges around consulting uh, on roads projects with, with Jacobs in, in the last few months. Um, traditionally, we're all familiar with standing in front of uh, uh, audiences in hotel rooms with uh, drawings put on boards where we uh, discuss the projects with members of the public in a very much a, a rushed and um, what would you call uh, packed room where people don't really get a chance to engage properly with the project team. What COVID 
uh, brought to the N2 project this year was an opportunity to expand that and properly engage um, and, and use communications tools that weren't pr previously used uh, within the uh, normal forums that, that the, these type of projects would use. And I think it, it has come out through the, uh, at the end, uh, having a better way of communicating with landowners. And maybe we, we as, a, as an industry can learn and move forward in a kind of a more active way of engaging with landowners. So today, um, I just want to have a quick talk about the traditional approach or the national uh, the objectives of public consultations, what we normally do on ro national road projects here in Ireland. Jane will have a look at what challenges were created by COVID-19, um, what, what difficulties we faced in, in engaging with the members of the public. I'll do a brief overview of the N2 road schemes, um, what they were about and what stages we're currently at. Jane will then look at the consultation tools that we brought to the fore with, with, that, consult, with that process. And then I'll finish up with some lessons learned on what I think we should do as an industry going forward. So first off, looking at um, the objectives of public consultations on national road projects. I'm sure you are all very, very familiar with, um, as I said, standing in, in hotel rooms with drawings put up on boards in front of uh, uh, stakeholders and landowners. Um, and it, 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 I don't know about everybody else, but I find it a very, uh, what would you call it, uh, non-personal venue. It's, it's, it's designed to provide information to landowners rather than get information from them. You know, there's, you know, the, the, the current project management manual says, you know, um, it'll be held to inform stakeholders. You know, it doesn't say uh, learn from the stakeholders. It says inform the stakeholders. There's a perception by, by, by landowners that it is a tick boxing exercise and tongue in cheek, it is somewhat when you look at what's in the, 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 the documentation. <laughs> um, by landowners, it, some of it is considered, we are considered as case building uh, in advance of a planning process. You know, and it's, it's somewhat designed to demonstrate that engagement rather than actually trying to engage. So for me, you know, I think we need to grow up and move forward as an industry and try and learn how better to engage with landowners. Um, as I say, consultations are normally designed around informing the general public of the project and, and, and hearing their comments about our decisions that we've made. Nothing about hearing about their issues, how, how is their access affected? They want to know more about what, how the, the scheme impacts them directly. And we don't go into those forums thinking like that. We go in there thinking that we want their opinion on what good work we've done. So I think, again, you know, we need to approach these processes in a, with a slightly different uh, mindset. You know, traditionally, we've used a number of, of tools in our consultation arsenal. We've, we've prepared brochures. We prefer uh, news articles. Um, we even wrote, uh, use radio uh, interviews, public displays. We prepare presentations to the elected officials. We use road signage and more recently we've used social media. But one item that we, we, uh, we should be using more of is the feedback. You know, only one of those items is about them providing information to us, more about us providing information to them. So again, is, is our consultation tools fit for purpose? It's a question to be answered. So what is the difficulties with the traditional approach? Um, we're missing key stakeholder groups, you know, commuters, carers, younger landowners, the hard of hearing, the hard of seeing, people with language difficulties. We don't really engage at a level that the landowners expect. You know, there's a lack of one-to-one -one face time. We tend to talk to large groups rather than dealing with the local issues. You know, you're meeting in crowded rooms, and with that, it is very difficult to look at individual case issues. You know, for example, um, you, you're standing in one of these rooms, a landowner comes up to you and say, I live in certain such a place. You have literally five seconds to figure out where that guy lives and what the issue is. There's no sort of personal approach to that guy's um, meeting, and he goes away feeling frustrated. And quite often the local, uh, local media newspapers or, or advertisements, they're not read or listened to by locals. So they miss the opportunity. They often come up to our consultations frustrated that they, didn't, they weren't aware that the event was on. 
So we feel that consultations need to be more engagement focused. You know, two or three days of public display it doesn't allow for sufficient time to fully engage with the with landowners. Typically, you would have 15 to 20 landowners per kilometre of route corridor. If you've got six corridors over, over six kilometres, that's a lot of landowners that you have to deal with. Because of that, there's a, there is a general mistrust in the process. There's a perceived lack of real engagement. There's a perception that submissions are not fully considered. You know, some people feel, rightly or wrongly, that, that uh, their, percept, their, their submissions are put into a box and not considered any further. And really, I feel that we now have an opportunity to engage on a personal level with affected landowners. You know, the landowners get to know the real project team, which builds confidence. The team get to know what the real issues are. And, and ironically, you get some great stories listening to who's married to who and who's related to who, which is always quite uh, enjoyable. But most importantly, it builds trust. It builds trust from the landowners to the project team and vice versa. So with that, Jane, um, Jane's going to uh, go through some uh, challenges that were created by, uh, by this project uh, and COVID-19. Thanks, Jerry. Um, I think that to start off, we have to recognize that around a quarter of the world's population has been affected by COVID in some form of lockdown. And even we are still experiencing restrictions. So COVID-19 has affected how we live our day-to-day -day lives and how we work. So it has definitely influenced how we need to engage with people on major projects, without a doubt. Um, and I think you can even see that successful engagement with the public um, has happened in two ways. It's either national engagement, uh, standing at your doorstep and clapping the uh, healthcare workers, or it's what's called hyper-local engagement, that your local area is, is, your people are helping each other by delivering groceries to the door. It's, it's that focused. So in terms of looking at how did COVID affect um, project communication, we wanted to check, was it still relevant to do um, a public engagement on a project? So back to basics then is what this slide is. Was engagement still needed? If you look at your technical stakeholders, such as your local authorities and your environmental, environmental experts, you still need to engage with these on a project. Your non-technical stakeholders, stakeholders are very importantly your local politicians who look at a project in terms of achieving their goals and also affecting their voters. So you have to tell them what's coming ahead or down the road. Um, and also key influ influencers such as um, organizations, be them local community groups, residence groups, or farming organizations like that. They like to be kept informed and their members trust them to tell them what's important. So overall, it's still important to engage during this, these unprecedented times, as Jerry said, you still need to uh, inform people. It's better for the project, for the community, and for the client. And we have found in Jacobs on different projects that if you don't inform people, then assumptions will be made. Uh, we are constantly getting inquiries as to whether the project is still going ahead. Is there funding available for it now, even with all the COVID uh, funds being diverted somewhere else? And if you don't give that information, a void is created and people will fill it themselves. So without a doubt, even though we're in lockdown or restrictions, for the good of the project, we would always recommend that you would still engage. So with that in mind, Jerry, if you go into the next slide. So as Jerry mentioned, we have a suite of communication tools that he is such as brochures and radio and media. Um, and a lot of them would still work during COVID, but some of them are not appropriate. So meeting with the organizations such as residence groups, have 
having large meetings with councillors um, or those intense open days, they are not suitable um, for COVID now. If you look back in March, they, we were unsure about them even back then. So in March, we had the two meter distancing. Then in May, we had the roadmap. In June, we had the hotels and guest house guidelines for reopening. In September, we had living with COVID and the rules for engagement um, or having meetings with different groups and sizes of groups have changed all along that time. And I suppose in the, in the general public's mind, you can measure it by weddings. Is it 50? Is it 25? Is it six? So all of that has change so you have to make sure that you're in compliance and when you're planning for meetings with people that that's uh, in compliance with the regulations um the intense one-to-one -one meetings that you might have with a stakeholder at, at a project office or in an open day leaning over maps is no longer possible you can't pour over maps and point that's not possible anymore and in considering the type of engagement you would have with the public, you have to make sure that there is that need to have it and that you're asking people who might be cocooners or, 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 or carers of cocooners to come into a venue outside of their bubble. So you have to ensure it's safe. And Golfgate is a huge example in that it has to be right and people such as politicians who are requested to turn up for a meeting you have to be you have to be aware of their nervousness of coming into a venue um, but even with all of these restrictions uh, there is a, necess a necessity to keep on engaging and telling people about the project so Jerry if you want to go on to the next um, page there so if you still have to use your traditional suite of tools such as brochures, media, interviews, but you can't do anything like an open day um, that is being used on every single project and you can't have those town hall meetings, then what can you do? Well, Jerry and myself and uh, the team felt that it was the perfect opportunity to engage on more online activity and this might be a vehicle to attract some of the stakeholders that we were missing in the normal state of in the normal run of the mill uh, engagement the commuters the family people who are busy so what this slide here does is it highlights the use of um, the internet by house households the Central Statistics Office published this back in April and it shows the change in usage from January to March. And remember in March, we were only a few months in uh, lockdown. So we can assume that this has improved. So if you even just look at the images, we were using um, an increased use of shopping, of buying uh, gardenware, of using emails, uh, of teaching, and of saying hello to family and friends over the um, internet. But I have circled there, uh, there was an increase um, of seeking people seeking information on health online and this is where it's interesting from a project communications point of view and is useful for Jerry's Jerry's purpose is that with this presence of COVID in our lives we have we have used the internet for more things and this is personal internet in your home we're not only using it for shopping and entertainment and talking over the video we were seeking out information so it seemed an appropriate tool to push people to view detailed information on a project. So we felt justified in using this, uh, uh, moving online to replace certain elements of these groups. You have to be aware, of course, is there connectivity in houses? And um, if you're talking about Dublin, 
then the stats are very good. Up to 95% of people in of households in Dublin have high speed, speed broadband. Um, if you're going to the border counties, it goes down to 71. Um, we talk about a client later on in the Monaghan area. For rural areas of Monaghan, it was down as low as 54% uh, for high speed. Um, but if you have a family, uh, it's almost guaranteed that you have some form of internet. If you're a single male living in a household or female living in a household, then it's less than that. But even with these, we felt that um, the stats were actually quite high. And in if you were using online opportunities to talk to people and engage people, plus the tradition, some of the traditional methods, that actually you were getting um, a further reach of stakeholders and this was now the time to, to bring this into project communications. So Jerry, if you just go on there, please. Um, so look, there are tons of technologies out there. We, we all uh, uh, have seen all of the Hollywood graphics and if you want it, you can get it. Um, but a successful online experience for a stakeholder is one that matches uh, their area and their expectations. So you really have to take into consideration whether it's a rural or an urban area. Um, what is the bandwidth coverage? It could be good in the main town in a county, but not so good along a route of a road. Um, the age profile of a stakeholder is important. If you, if depending on the stage of the project, you're in, you might be focusing in on landowners or more broad base. Um, and you could take a, an estimate or from experience of meeting your stakeholders, you know their age profile. People are concerned that the over 60s, 70s will not engage in an online forum. So we wanted to test that. Also the stage of your project. Is it the beginning of a project? Is it in the middle of the project? Are people expecting the information? Or, or can you wait a little bit longer? The public and client expectations. Um, you might have a budget to have Hollywood effects, but if you go too glossy on a project and too slick, that might actually be off-putting to a stakeholder who thinks that you're way too distanced from them. And so it might necessarily, might not be appropriate even though you have money to burn which is what we all want. And also the cost of the options uh, is very important. What is your client willing to pay? What can they afford? So all of these things have to be taken into consideration um, when you're moving to replace the, the, some of the options that have been used traditionally and you're trying to broaden your reach of engagement. So Jerry, can you go on to the next slide, please? So what does this mean for the end two? Um, we definitely all agreed with, with the clients and ourselves that we needed to engage a wider audience. We had um, a couple of public consultations already, so we needed to broaden our reach. Um, we could have a technical solution that would deliver in a low bandwidth area and um, but we also needed uh, lots of tools to engage with people who are comfortable with digital but also give them an alternative to find out the information um, we needed def different channels to tell the public that there was a consultation going on and the team felt very strongly that in order to get useful information, they needed to have one-to-one -one contact with their stakeholders. So we had to find a way of doing that too. So Jerry, I'll hand over to you to tell us a bit in particular about the N2 case study. Thank you very much, Jane. So looking at the N2, just to give you a bit of scale for the project and, and Jane will, will talk a little later about the uh, numbers of of landowners that we had to engage with. Um, but uh, just to give you a shape of the project, the N2 for those who I'm sure, uh, who those are familiar, uh, is the primary route serving the northwest of the country. Um, and it is uh, regionally very, very important for the, the growth of that area. The projects we're dealing with uh, is, is split in two. We have two particular schemes. One is the uh, RD to, uh, to uh, Castle Blaney, which is 22 kilometres long and is managed by uh, Tommy Cleary in our, in our project team. And we've got Clontibbert to the Northern Irish border, which is 28 kilometres long and is managed by uh, Lock and Hogan in our project team. 
So just a little bit about the background to the scheme. Um, the scheme has, is, is fully supported both from a European, a national, regional and a local level. Um, and as uh, the, the road itself, uh, as for those who know it, um, is a single carriageway with um, uh, some layout and junction deficiencies. There are overtaking opportunities, but these are below current standards. The existing road is nearing capacity as it currently stands, uh, and there are improvements required to journey time reliability. Um, those again who know the area will, will understand that the area has a high collision occurrence rate. Um, uh, unfortunately for us, I think the, the local um, uh, residents were very, very much, at, that was very much one of the key uh, requirements of the project for too many of their uh, loved ones being lost on the road. So we, we, there are also limited provision for vulnerable road users along that corridor. So there's a clear need for this scheme, and both regionally and locally. The scheme development to date, um, the scheme was originally, it was, it was reactivated um, in 2017-2018 with the launch of Project Ireland 2040. In 2019, uh, Jacobs carried out the feasibility and consideration of the options. We carried out our first public consultation uh, in June, July in 2019. And then we had our uh, the second public consultation on the options in November, December 2019. What are those uh, consultations for, for um, just for completeness, where um, uh, hotel events, standard hotel events, standard traditional events, and, and we did get a lot of feedback at that time as, as to the lack of reach into the community, lack of media exposure, lack of advertising, um, etc. So that, that was one of the things that was influencing our decision for the current uh, consultation process. So in 2020, we carried out an assessment and identification of the emerging preferred route, and we carried out the public consultation of that emerging preferred route uh, in August and September of this, uh, of this year. Going forward, we're hoping to get to go into phase three and carry out the preliminary design and the environmental impact assessment uh, of the uh, preferred route. Just a bit of uh, uh, some graphics for those who enjoy it, the layouts. And um, for, the, for the second consultation, we went out to the public with uh, six route options for each uh, project. And it's, uh, it's notable to um, understand that at these consultations, we were influenced um, going forward with uh, various comments we received at that time. For example, on, on the Clontibret to Border route, we, uh, um, we, were, we discussed an additional link that would link our, the green route here to the yellow route, which wasn't previously identified, and that was brought forward into our uh, option selection process. Within on RD, we identified additional um, constraints uh, at a particular location, at a particular crossroads, which influenced the route corridor width along the existing road there. It's also notable that the uh, both projects um, included the existing alignment as, as a route option, as the members of the public um, considered that widening of the existing route was a viable option. Uh, and, and that was very much something that was up to fore of our consideration in our assessment. So I'm sure those who've been on road projects will be familiar with the graphic here. It's taken from the um, project management manual. But one thing we I wanted to emphasize here is we aligned our public consultations here, two and three, to the assessment process. What we've done is in, initially, um, we had something like 16, 17 route options identified at feasibility stage. We carried out the engineering environment and the economy assessment of those route options to, to shortlist down to the six options I've just shown. Um, that they were then brought to the public consultation number two. It was only then that we uh, looked at the six options and assessed them under the, the, the uh, economy, safety, environment, accessibility, physical and integration uh, uh, items and uh, brought the emerging preferred route to the uh, public consultation number three uh, in, the, in the months just gone. We're hoping to go forward with a preferred option in, in the coming months. So just to have a quick look at uh, the emerging preferred route at, that we published. So for our, the RD to Casablanca scheme, uh, we, uh, the option that was, uh, that was identified as the emerging preferred route was the uh, 
uh, an alignment that uh, follows the existing corridor. Whereas the um, contemporary to border scheme, um, we ended up with a hybrid route um, that uh, included three previous corridors, but linked together with that additional uh, element that was identified um, through the consultation number two. The route corridors that we brought to the uh, public uh, are typically 400 meters wide. And that, has, that has been done to allow us to develop the design in the following phases. Um, we did show an indicative road alignment, uh, that dotted blue line you, you can see on the screen, but we didn't um, provide uh, any more engineering uh, at, that, at this level of design, uh, at this stage of the consultation. We did identify an initial uh, junction strategy as shown by the blue and pink dots, um, which provided for full and uh, unrestricted movement junctions. And um, our assessment was uh, carried out based on a type two dual carriageways for both schemes. And that again has to be reassessed as part of the phase three design going forward. So, Jane, I'll hand it back to you to look at the consultation uh, tool. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so with knowing that you were at this stage and you had a, an emerging preferred route, uh, to progress the project, it was definitely felt we needed to engage. It was the right time um, and we had options. So you have to manage the expectations of the stakeholder as jerry said previously what are their expectations and then what are the expectations of the project team what do they need out of a public consultation um so we needed to engage with groups of people and lots of people who might not be comfortable attending a meeting we needed a technology um, options as well for people seeing as we couldn't have open days we needed a way of uh, facilitating urgent meetings so as Jerry said we had now gone to the stage of it being an emerging preferred route and if you were a landowner on that route you could be extremely concerned picking up a phone and demanding a meeting and in the say the old version we would have answered that by saying come along to the open day that might have been in two weeks time and that's never never very satisfying so we needed to be able to facilitate that urgent meeting also we knew that uh, landowners would want repeat meetings that you could have somebody who would ask questions mull over the answers and then require a second meeting with perhaps another member of their family to digest fully what was being explained to them and the impacts on their land or access. And also we felt that a six week period of consultation without a doubt was appropriate for this road. We had done shorter periods previously and um, it just didn't facilitate and wasn't suitable for the number of people with an interest in it. So therefore, especially in these you know, restrictive times of COVID, we had to allow for a six weeks consultation period. The project team definitely wanted to keep on progressing um, and they needed to get useful insights from uh, the landowner stakeholders in particular, but all stakeholders. They wanted to get more detailed information about land holdings, who owned the land, whether houses were derelict or weren't access points and everything like that. So there was a necessity to engage and um, in this way. So Jerry, if you could go on to the next slide, please. So what did we do? Um, we, as mentioned previously, we needed a good media campaign to explain to people that there was a consultation coming up and please make a submission or give us feedback on it. The, lo the client, the local county council, Monaghan County Council did uh, a really good job. They in employed um, three local papers and one local radio station. They had repeat advertising standards advertising in the papers flagging that the consultation period was coming up and then during it again and again there were about three rounds of um, adverts put in the paper they always had a spokesperson available for the radio or any interviews and that was very key 
it meant that the papers were coming to us to for information. We had this hyper localized information, like I mentioned previously, that is, is uh, successful during COVID. We had uh, the client again put up over 27 road signs say as so as people were driving along on the road they it was flagged because they were used to seeing the signage now at time of consultation i think that shows a really good involvement and buy-in by the client to the consultation process um, as jerry mentioned we had gone from a number of route corridor options down to one emerging preferred route but you still had a lot of people living along the route corridor options that felt they might be on the emerging preferred route. So we needed a really quick way of informing these people that uh, their route was no longer the chosen or the emerging option. And hence we sent out 6,000 flyers to people along these corridors. So they were getting postal information in through their door. There was no need to go anywhere else to receive that information. It was coming to them. And then uh, very importantly, the landowner packs were sent to over a thousand householders. So the land registry gave us the owner of the land and the team created a very specific pack for those. And I'll show you that in a minute. But we then also went um, online. We had a database of 750 addresses that had been built up for the past two years of people who wanted to be kept informed of the project. And an email was sent to them on the launch day of the public consultation. And in there was details and we had a click through and we got a huge response to that. Uh, other ways of accessing information was through a project website and a phone line that had been established um, over a year previously. So the picture underneath the stop sign is the one that Jerry used earlier. It's the, it's the, um, thanks Jerry. <laughs> it's a typical open day. It's the workhorse of engagement or public consultation. It's extremely well received and accepted by onboard Planola. Every project does it. They are very intense days for the project team um, and they can be successful or, or not. You can have um, a, a very long day that three or four people come in in a steady stream and then in the evening it's manic and you have a lot of people crowded around in project team members and this was no longer available to us so uh, as we said previously we felt that a lot of aspects of this open day are good but a lot of it is quite frustrating for the project team so with the opportunity created by COVID or the challenge we had an opportunity to go elsewhere but before I tell you about that I'll just show you the the detail that was gone into the land donor packs so Jerry so this shows I think um, the care that the project team put into each to reaching out to affected potentially affected stakeholders and this was received extremely well by stakeholders they felt um, that people were looking after them or were knowledgeable about their land so each landowner received a cover letter explaining the project and the stage it was at. They received a brochure appropriate to the scheme. They received a questionnaire or a feedback form looking for their input. A corridor uh, layout, which was similar to one, uh, which was the same as used in the leaflets. Then they received um, a scheme information explaining what Jerry has has talked us through earlier on and then an individual landowner drawing and this varied according to where you were on the route so it was specific to your area of land and that was received very well it was very intense and there was a postal drop to all the landowners but it was received extremely well so Jerry if you could go on so exceptional times, new tools. So this is what we were very excited about um, on the N2 from um, a project team point of view and a, com a communications point of view. We wanted to have the feel of this open day in a local hotel venue, 
but have it accessible 24 hours a day for the six weeks providing the information. So we went online. So you probably know it as a virtual open day or an online consultation experience. We wanted it to feel familiar. It had a booking function to, to have that elusive one-to-one -one conversation with a project team member. Um, but my favorite is that it had an opening uh, video and I just have a screenshot here of the star of the video which was Jerry um, and it took a bit of persuading but I think the reasons um, were very very important we wanted people to see somebody that they may have met already at a previous to previous open days and um, a familiar face somebody who represents the project and that they weren't just walking into this artificial room generated in america it had to show it had to be quite irish with the green fields and um, it had to have a welcoming face somebody to, who was explaining to them what was happening in these rooms and also Jerry explained that we needed their feedback we needed feedback from stakeholders so please provide it the link is there and um, if you want to view it yourself but Jerry if you go on to the next screen please so this is a, an example of one of the rooms we had two and you could enter the room and go to the um, RD scheme or you could go to the Clon Tibbert border scheme. Um, the logos of the clients were on the walls um, you had a series of posts or boards there were people in the room with you um, you could click on the information icon above a poster and it would zoom out you could download any of this information save it for later you could print it out all of that was uh, available and up on top of the blue band at the the top of the image there you can see you can chat to us and send us an email you could go back to where you started and there was that booking function again which um, showed that you could book to have a telephone call or a video call or later on in the period of consultation under strict COVID conditions, COVID safely conditions, you could have a face to face meeting. But um, probably the most interesting element of the room for the engineers anyway, and a lot of the stakeholders were the maps. The maps were very detailed. We had a series of those and we had an interactive map so you could type in your air code or your locality and it would zoom into your property uh, relative to this 400 meter corridor that Jerry mentioned previously. And that was hugely reassuring for a lot of people on the other route corridors. And it was very clear people could scroll up and down and they spent a lot of time viewing that map. So if you could go on, great. Also in the room, we tried to make it look like something, you know, that there was a table in the room with a load of feedback forms, something that you'd see in every open day. Um, there was a form to fill online and you could send it off straight away or you could download and fill it in at your leisure or post it uh, to us as well. Um, we also had uh, an awful lot of uh, people requesting meetings. So the format of the meeting was either a phone call with a member of the project team or a video call using MS Teams. And this proved very successful. So we could take those urgent meetings that people wanted urgently and deal with those, um, you know, the, the worries quite early on in the public consultation so they didn't develop into something bigger and it worked out very well that the communication team could get an understanding of the queries that people had and match them up with Jerry or as you mentioned previously Tommy and Lorcan or the environmental sections of the project team as well so you could um, match people to what their queries were and also as Jerry said uh, he needed to get good information so what this instead of a, a crowded room for an open day you had advanced warning of who you were going to meet so you could take the time to prepare look at their property in relation to the road and then when somebody called in they were immediately treated with 
um, knowledge and expertise and it put them at ease uh, and felt that they were being taken seriously. So Jerry, if you want to go on to the next um, slide, please. I'll just quickly run through this because um, I know you've a, a good bit to go through. It's really the backup of why going on, on online is really good. Um, there's loads of information in the UK um, and Australia where it's it's uh, quite used quite frequently. In Ireland, not so much. But we were trying to hit, if you even look at the images there, we were trying to get people access to the project information 24 hours a day. And most people do it on their phone at night time. And also the picture down on the bottom left reminds me of Tommy and Lorcan because they're both <laughs> uh, fathers with young kids and constantly trying to juggle. And the only time they get to look at things outside of work or enter entertainment is with the family around. So we were looking for that age group as well. Jerry, if you want to go into the next slide, please. Then a second element was the face-to-face -face meetings, which the team and the client felt were necessary. So it definitely was no longer possible to have the crowded room, but there were some stakeholders who wanted to meet with the project team. So therefore, we had two venues, um, the Newermore Hotel and the Four Seasons Hotel. And it was all in compliance with the uh, guidelines that were mentioned earlier from June, the reopening of the hotels from uh, government guidelines. And you can see that the pods are very well spaced apart. There was PPE, there was deep cleaning between appointments. We had a large screen there, which allowed the stakeholder to view the um, the map in relation to the road and their properties. If you go into the next slide, please, Jerry. This is a close up of um, the individual uh, pod. Uh, so there was a sneeze guard between the project member, and we allowed just a maximum of three family members to attend a meeting. Uh, we worked extremely hard and for a long time in preparing these meetings with the venues, um, but it was received very well, and the project teams, we had four four pods um, in the room, two teams, and it was constantly busy. So Jerry, I will just give a quick rundown on, did it work? Were we happy? Did we get a good reach? So overall, in the six weeks we had, had um, direct liaison with over 1,200 contacts. They were made up mostly of uh, about 500 phone calls, uh, 300 emails, and close to 400 appointments. So this was huge engagement with direct contact. So some of them were definitely repeat. But when you think that we were gleaning information of, that would be useful for the project. That, that's a lot of good information and it was being recorded on our database. It's much more useful than three panicked, crowded days in a hotel venue. If you go on to the next slide. This is very interesting. I think we got um, a certain number of information from the visitors into the virtual room. The profile of the visitor, we were worried about the older profile of the landowner stakeholders, but you could see that it's pretty even between all age groups. So the over 55s were definitely present in the virtual room. The age group of the busy commuter, the, the people with maybe language difficulties or not accessible, accessible to go into hotel venues, they were present there in the 34 to 54 um, band. And also something that you don't really get go, uh, going into a busy open day is the under 34s. They leave it up to the older generation who are landowners and you don't really get a lot of um, those. So it was good to see that this was what they were used to and we were providing a vehicle for them to understand and read project information. Um, also, our website figures went up. We had uh, 6,300 visitors. On a normal day outside of consultation, we'd have about 100 a week, so it was a great increase. The virtual room got 2,700 visitors. And interestingly, the time spent in the room changed. In the beginning, you had people on their mobile phones clicking in and having a quick look 
at the information and they spent about four minutes in there. Then over time, as people were moved from the mobile phone to their desktop and perhaps were preparing for meetings or following on from meetings and discussing it with family, they were spending up to 11 minutes in the virtual room looking at the information on the boards. To me, that's extremely high. And Jerry, if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, interestingly too, we asked people, how did you hear about this consultation? How did you hear about the virtual room? And out top came postal information. So not surprisingly in that we had sent out 6,000 leaflets and a thousand targeted landowner packs. So Postal definitely complemented the online experience. And it was a mix of traditional and non-traditional um, techniques. The local paper came out top as well. So it encouraged then, it was good information for the client to know that it was worthwhile paying for an advert because you were going, you had that hyper local engagement going on. Local radio was really small. Um, and that's reflected nationally. People go have gone to uh, Radio One to hear their information rather than the local the local um, radio. Um, there's an example there of some of the media coverage in the press, and it was important to show a picture of the room so that people felt safe in coming into. The, the venue that they had made an appointment in. I had to put up for the sake of uh, the boss, Kira Murphy and, and her team, I had to put up flawless communication strategy. And then exactly the thing that we were looking for to try and get our reach out there. It was great to read a headline in the paper saying no one will be left behind. That was just a great reinforcement of what we were aiming at. So Jerry, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Jane. Well, one element, I'd just like to go back on what Jane said there. What you've got to um, understand is all of those meetings that we had were all at least 45 minutes long. So they weren't, landowners weren't just getting 10 minutes of our time in, in a packed hall with probably the wrong person for their particular issue. They were getting a targeted meeting of 45 minutes, which was really, really important. And really, uh, the, the landowners felt engaged because of that uh, time that they were given. So I just want we want to just close really in the next couple of next few slides by just giving you what we feel uh, the project team that what we've learned from the process and what we would recommend going forward. From we've fortunately we've more pros than cons. So we felt that the process was very well received by the elected officials. It went unchallenged in terms of level of detail and duration of consultation. What I mean by that is in public consultation number two, we received a lot of objections by the local officials and by the, the um, uh, objection groups, local objection groups. They felt that the, four -week, the standard four-week consultation period wasn't sufficient for them to uh, pen and vice an objection. And as such, we, we were under pressure to extend the consultation period. Because of the reach and the, and the extent of the engagement that was underwent, underwent at public consultation number three, we, we received not a single request for, for, for a, an extension to the process, nor any uh, change to the what would do to our level of communication. The, the quality of the engagement uh, it was better for the project. We were able to engage at one-to-one, -one as, as, as Jane said. We now have a traceable record of all that engagement. Um, again, you picture the scene of, of, of meeting landowners in a packed hall. You have five minutes meeting with them. You're trying to take notes and you're trying to record it. 50% of the time those notes go or, go, or, or inaccurately um, recorded. And then you get into trouble at a later stage where people say, oh, I met Jerry Healy at a meeting and I said such and such, and you've no record of it. We were now had traceable records of all that engagement, which was really, really important. Um, the level of objection to the need for the road decreased in the submissions received. So because people felt that they were being engaged, the, the, the objection to the need for the road decreased, decreased significantly. And that, and that was a major, major plus. We went out with one objection, have we picked the right road? And without, uh, I think we've received um, sm a very small number, two, three, four percent of the submissions received uh, voiced that opinion. There was a general satisfaction with the level of information received. 
Um, we had a number of uh, people come along where we had to, had to actually ask them to make a submission because they, 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 felt, they felt they they, they had heard enough. They didn't see that they would, it would gain them any further um, help. So that, that, was, that was very encouraging to know that people had received all the information that they could. And there was, a, there was a greater level of engagement. We had, as Jane said, we had a number of people come back for two or three meetings, which was really, really good. Um, the access to the online experience was not an issue. We were, we were really, really worried that um, certain age groups wouldn't be able to access the technology. Um, we were afraid that uh, people were, would be nervous of using um, MS Teams as a, a communication tool. And that that uh, Portugal fear was not was not warranted whatsoever. And I think what was happening there was, as uh, as people have gotten used to COVID, they they've gotten used to communicating with their loved ones across the world using MS Teams and Zooms and uh, WhatsApp or whatever technology they're using. And as such, people were actually reasonably comfortable using the technology, which was uh, which was great. It was fantastic to see how um, older age groups uh, were engaged. It was great to see, as Jane said, younger age groups now actually engaging in, in a consultation process, which we wouldn't previously have seen. You know, we had families come in, you know, and, and families come in with actively engaged, you know, rather than just sitting by their uh, children, sitting by their parents' sites. Um, because they're, the younger generation were able to access the information in a forum that they were familiar with. We now feel that the, that the path through the pl planning process will be easier because the landowners start, are feeling engaged. There's a sense of no surprises, which is great. From a cons point of view, it's costly in terms of money, time and resources. We had 10 people in two teams running this, running this consultation. So it's, you do, don't underestimate the amount of effort that goes into something like this. We had six weeks of intensive engagement uh, and as, as a result, a delay to our, what we're, our, the program we were working to. Um, we were very, very, very lucky in terms of lockdown timing. We, we, the consultation happened right in between the two lockdowns. So from that perspective, we were, we, were, we, we were very, very fortunate. If we had been under level five lockdowns at the minute, I'm not sure we'd be having the same conversation. Mm -hmm. Going forward, um, what we're thinking really is that virtual consultation should be adopted regardless of COVID-19. We really have reached out to a level of users that are that previously wouldn't have been able to attend these venues. Um, you now have a repository of information that's that's easy to access. The public can refer to it over and over and over again, rather than only having two or three days of access. Um, the interactive mapping that was made available, everybody found very useful, particularly being able to use their air code to uh, access where they live. Um, we feel more time needs to be left for one-to-one -one dis uh, discussions going forward, in person or using technology. Really, we need to understand and address individuals' concerns and needs. If you are going with a, uh, an, open, an open day post-COVID, when, when it all goes away, consider extending it. Consider, consider allowing time for these one-to-one -one meetings. You know, consider allowing slots to be booked with your team, with the specialists. You know, it's, it was so useful to the landlords that we, we came to the meeting pre-prepared. We knew where they lived. We knew the issues that they faced. We had their, their um, correspondence from their previous consultations. So there was no surprises. They, we, we, we attended the meetings in, uh, informed. We can also attend the meeting by specialists. You know, we have certain individuals want to know more about the environment or want to know more about drainage. And as such, we can target those meetings with those specialists. As I said, public are now more comfortable with, with video calling, you know, so, you know, embrace that. You use that technology going forward. As I mentioned earlier, there's a more accurate uh, recording of notes for meetings. And it's available to all members of the team. And that was very important as well, because we had members of the, of the public come for an, a number of meetings and met two or three of us at different points in time. But each one of us had access to, to the exact same information. And, and therefore, the, the, again, the landowner felt engaged with and, and um, felt that we were um, professional in our approach to their concerns. 
consider providing that letter drop to advertise the event. Um, again, this reduces complaints from the public regarding that they've not been made aware of the event. So that would be our recommendation going forward. And that would be COVID or not COVID. Um, and with that, I just want to uh, thank a few people that brought us on this journey, particularly uh, Tommy Cleary and Lorcan Horgan on the project team. We really drove the two projects. Our client team, uh, team Ambrose Clark from Westmead NRO and Roshan Moore from Monaghan County Council. Our digital team, Keith and Adam, who really did a sterling job on the uh, virtual room. And of course, Jane's team, um, Kira Bergen and Kleena Hughes. Thank you all very much. So I'll open the back to um, Carol for questions.